Ben Reed, redeployable, we're recording. Welcome to the H Hour podcast studio. How are you doing? You, you all right? <laughs> <laughs> How's yeah, it going? Mate, mate. Yeah, good, 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 good. Perfect. Mate, it's good to have you here. Glad we can, glad we can sort it out. And um, nice and early too. I like them early. Yeah. I, I feel like I'm more coherent early in the morning. Yeah. And yeah. The, the longer the day goes on, the more is on my mind and the less I can form a decent thought. I agree. So, like, you lose willpower throughout the day, don't you, I think? So, I've just had a baby, so this is... I used to get up at 5 a.m. every morning, and now I'm getting up at 7 because I'm hanging out all the time. So, it's good to get up early yeah. again and get here. Definitely. Uh, right. It is the 1st of March. Happy St. David's Day, Hugh. Thank you very much, Hugh. Uh, happy St. David's Day, Welsh people. 1st of March, it is mental time. I don't think I've known a time where in my life, where the world has been this fucking crazy yeah. within the space of a week. Yeah. Like, normal to crazy within the space of a week. You got, you got, so right now, you got Ukraine and Russia uh, holding talks in Belarus while Russia are smashing the shit out of Ukraine. Um, you've got, Russia has been banned from pretty much inv being involved in anything at all FIFA have banned from all football yeah. haven't they um, they can't get they can't even fly over Europe at the moment let alone land in Europe all the banks have been frozen I've seen a call this morning for uh, from Biden to call calling for cryptocurrency exchanges to ban Russian related transactions uh, what's your take on it all what do you think the outcome is going to be here um, I don't it's, it's a hard one isn't it like I haven't I I and I was saying to you a second ago, I've I've kind of detached myself from the news for the last two years. I don't I don't read it, don't read any papers, d deleted Facebook, don't don't watch the news, and I've watched more news in the last five days than I've watched probably in the last five years. So I started minimising it within the last two years. Same thing. What prompted you to do it? I just don't know. I I, I I'm I don't know. I'm not a conspiracy theorist at all. I don't by any means. But I just I think that uh, uh, you can't, I just don't feel like I can trust what, you can't trust what you read, you can't trust what you listen to. Like just even some of these videos that you're seeing on Ukraine now, like it's it's proven that some of them are from like 2014, some of the videos that they're putting out there. So there are people engineering like information to, to, to sway people's mindsets, I think. So I just, I've just taken myself away from it. I just don't. Which is, which is not 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 great, is it really? I should know what's going on day to day, but it it means I'm, I'm not I'm not too that bothered. Obviously, you know the big things that are happening. I knew that Ukraine Russia was happening. You just kind of if it's on LinkedIn, speaking to people, people you'll you'll talk about it. And if you want to immerse yourself in it, then you can. But for me, like this last five days, just before even before when they were like amassing all the the troops at the borders, I, I said to my to my wife like it's something a bit different about this I think and then that's why I've just gone I've gone deep on the different you know different news channels just sitting there feeding the baby watching news all day yeah I uh, yeah I <coughs> I pretty much been BBC RP, well, any of the big news outlets BBC Sky with the main ones like, so before that I would check in definitely the BBC a few times a day looking to see what was going on and then it was this, it was the pandemic when the pandemic started for the same reasons as for anyone in your uh, a little bit of background noise, Ben's got his very <laughs> very lively dog in. <laughs> she's enjoying eating uh, whatever she's eating. She's yeah, fine, mate. She's all right. You, that, none of this, will, hardly any of this, will be coming through the. Uh, yeah, give, give that, it to her that's good. She's in, she's, yeah, uh, she's uh, we, I promise that she wouldn't be <laughs> that that lively, and she's just decided now. <laughs> hardly any of this will be coming through the mic. So oh, good. Fine, yeah, yeah. good. Oh, good. Oh, she's over now. Um, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so I started being at the beginning of the pandemic, and the reason being sort of what you alluded to. Not because I don't think it isn't possible to get the truth or accurate reporting or accurate stories online. I think that there is so many that aren't, like you were saying, this misinformation. And I, again, not a conspiracy theorist. I don't think it's, it's like a concerted effort on the whole to uh, provide misinformation to whatever. Oh, spray one's opinion to X, Y, Z. I do think that goes on, but I think that the reason there's so much misinformation is simply because 
this there's so much reward people can get from doing it in various different ways you know from a, an individual going oh, i think i'll post this bullshit tweet or this bullshit photo which i know is bullshit but if i put it on i know it's going to get a lot mm. of attention all they're after is attention to other things like trying to sway the stock markets to trying to change opinion on a, on a, a public individual to trying to push a ma a, a, you know, a, um, a, a, a mandate or trying to push your views on veganism or anything yeah. like this so yeah and i ended up reducing it because i, I just found it extremely stressful yeah it was like almost like the brain would go into a into a you know when your computer just freezes not freezes. You can just see it's like caught in a cycle. Just go around the same thing. The the, the windows popping up, the popping yeah. back, popping. You can see it's trying to do something. Just stuck in a cycle of going. It doesn't know what to do. It's like it got a load of conflicting information. It's shit, I don't know what to do here. That's what I was like. Yeah. I just I was like I don't know what to think. This is I don't know what to think about this, and it's so stressful. Yeah. So I'm like bin it. <laughs> yeah, and is your life better? Is your life been better? Two <laughs> yeah. years. Yeah. My life. I'm not. I don't feel like I'm missing out on anything. Like having Facebook. Like get. You can easily get like even with Facebook is on your phone or whatever social media you use, you get sucked into it, can't you? You get sucked into spending most of your time. Start, they do it on time purpose, is, right? The time is everything. Yeah. Yeah. But the see, the challenge I've got, right, and the challenge a lot of people have got, um, I think is, well, for myself, I, I need to be, I, well, one, I need to have some sort of a handle on what's going on because I, I have to have conversations like yeah, this, right? right. Um, can you imagine what conversations would be like if I, I had no clue what was going on? It'd be uh, like <laughs> rugby. Yeah, let's, let's, rugby yeah, let's talk about the same thing we talk about in every single podcast. Yeah, rugby, <laughs> Formula One, uh, <laughs> uh, mental health every time. But yeah, so I need a handle like that, and plus I need to use social media to, like, yeah. to um, put each episode out, for example. Yeah. But at the same time, right now I'm thinking, do I? This is a question I've had the last three weeks, especially on the social media piece. Like, do I? Podcast is a really interesting one, I think, in terms of marketing because it doesn't it doesn't really let's say you organic we we use the social media organically, so you're not paying for advertising or whatever. Podcasting doesn't podcasts don't grow in terms of audience um based on your social media stuff. Yeah. It's predominantly I don't know how it works, but I like depends on like your target audience, doesn't it, as well? Like where where yeah. does your target audience live? Like, where do they spend the time? Because not everyone's cutting off social, are they? Yeah, that's true. I suppose that's different for me as well because I don't have a target audience. I just, it's like, right, on my opinion, it's like, if people are interested, they're going to listen if they're not, they can fuck off. I'm not yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I understand that. But then, like, if you break it down, you probably do have a target audience in a way. Like, uh, you you naturally, I think, veteran service, serving members of the forces are going to naturally be drawn to this, right? Because there is a, a whole services theme. But you're right. Like it's a lot of this is word of mouth. But I think I'm thinking about this redeployable now. It's like, wh where do we, where, where do the the people that we want to work with live? And the reality is, you've got to start. I mean, I'm going off a tangent here, but you've got to start, um, start breaking them down into different segments based on the types of people that they are, and then breaking out where those people live and being really targeted like that. I think that's a, a more like a sales and marketing tactic in the software world. Go um, on, explain that more. It's just, I mean, I I do it. I mean, the the way I, the way I've done it is I've broken down service leavers into different groups and different categories. And so I, you've got the best ones like Power Edge in one group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then everyone just, else who's like substandard. Yeah, they're the other group. Power Edge number one, then re <laughs> then Reams, then Signals. <laughs> no, no, not even a, a core level or like a rank level. More of like uh, I call I call things names like. Uh, one of them, okay, one of them is like second career timer. So what, a second career timer, what's a second career timer to you? What would that mean to you? Second career timer. So they've got enough time left to go and have a full second career after they leave. Or they want. Yeah, they, they, they want. want. More importantly, they want. They've done the time. They're a timer. They've done the 22, 24, whatever. The t it could be longer. And then next thing is they don't want a coaster. They don't, they're not a coaster. They're not a status quo seeker. They're not a... I and mean, these are all the different ones. I just call things names I always have because then you remember it and then it starts to grin in you. But yeah, second grade time, they're, like, they're, they're going out there. They, they've done the 22, 24, but they're hungry. They want to go and they commit into another career because they see the military career is just the, the start of the professional career. Everyone should think that way. Yeah. Everyone should think that Everyone way. Everyone doesn't, They though. don't, though. No. Stay, I didn't. 
what's it what do I call it it's oh, I should remember the first one the first one is uh, easy out e- um, easy outers I think it's an easy outer yeah it is easy outer it's easy outer they've done the time they don't want to they don't want to do the are chilled they're sitting on the pension and they're, they're happy and that if they've done 20, 22, 24 30 years whatever they've done they deserve to do what they want but like do they want to commit to a commercial career after the military or do they want to go and do something for 25, 30 grand a year where they can just chill out, you know, smoke, smoke a cigarette, chill, have, an, have a good Gucci 20 years in Civic Street. Like there's there's loads of true. different mindsets. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that either, is there? No, it's true, yeah. Yeah, go on, what else? This is interesting. What else? Um, easy Are you out. discriminating? <laughs> yeah, discriminating. No, I'm not. I, I just think, I just think, like, for each to own, whoever, if someone wants to co- coast through the, the professional life and then pr- the professional career isn't that important to them, then it's fair play to them. They do. I'm not, I think everyone's got the right to their own kind of opinion. I, I, you've got early outers, so young, young folk, one to six years, they've been in, they got out early. You've got pro 30s, Pro thirties, uh, so they're they're the people who could have done up to twelve years, and now they're getting into the thirties. Like, right, I'm going for it. This is my time to really. Nail. That's I'd say that I'm more. I was more that. I did just shy of twelve years, and I was like, right, I've I've fucked around in my twenties, and I've I had a good career in the army, but now's the time to kind of knuckle down and you know make a professional career out of it, doing something that I I wouldn't say I love the I wouldn't say I love the army. I say I love the army for some reasons, but it wasn't like my calling, if you know what I mean. I wasn't, what I did in the army wasn't, it didn't define me. It was like a stepping stone for me to come into civilian life, I think. So, pro is then you've got coasters, we've said. Um, Civi Savvy's, Civi Savvy. Go on. Civi Savvy's, um, <laughs> they've done. They've done. Like I don't. I. I don't just work. And me and my sister and I don't just work with like people who are leaving the, the services. We work with people who've been out of the services army and had a career or two careers in, in Civvy Street, and then they want to make a move, and that's that's fine as well. They're figuring out Civvy Street like everyone else, so they're Civvy Savvies. And then the last one is your sales generals, people who who have left the army, who are now in sales, so they've got some experience in in a commercial like. In the commercial world, so they're they're what I would rock in the different kind of. There's more, and you could go all day, couldn't you? But yeah, yeah. sales is a tough one. Yeah, I think I had a brief foray into it, right? Yeah, and not a great time in life. We should help, but one of the things I found, which makes me really admire people in sales, is that is many many times it's commission based yeah right obviously you may have a like a baseline and you know more about this than I do like a baseline salary or might just be purely commission based but from the stuff i worked in the the rejection rate so you mm-hmm. could you could make how i don't know however many pitches a flipping day or a week or whatever depending on what kind of stuff you were selling and what kind of client it was a potential customer it was the rate of rejection is really high mm. Uh, w- what I experienced and it was it wasn't just because I was shit I was alright at it but uh, in where I was working yeah. um, the rejection was broke me mm. broke me it's like what do you mean you don't want to fucking buy it <laughs> yeah you you're know, more invested than you that you were like the 30th person to say, <laughs> yeah. what do you mean you don't want to fucking buy it it, would, it ground me down it ground me yeah. down I understood why why it would happen but still because it's like every single thing you, you, you're riding on you're mega confident bag of confidence yeah. Doing your pitch, you know it's going to work for them, and they just turn around and say no for yeah. for whatever reason. For whatever reason, it used to, used to break me. <laughs> used to break me. It's, there's a there, there are, I think there are a ton of variables to it. Like in sales, you say sales, and like I hated the word word salesman. I left I left the army to move into sales, but not like you know I go down to the local market and buy twenty stolen iPhones and try and flog them to my estate. It's like not that kind of sales. <laughs> It's more it's bi- business to business sales. It's like selling to other businesses, selling a solution to other businesses. So it's all, there's like variables. What you're saying there, you're pitching 30 times in a day. That's transactional, more transactional sales, if you will. What do you mean? Transactional is like lower lower value deals, more of them. So you've got a target to hit. You could have a million pound target to hit. And if you're transactional, if you're on the lower end, you've got to do as the master would say, loads and loads of small deals to get to your million pound toll. Whereas 
the higher you go up, you go up uh, through the stages like mid, small to medium businesses, mid market enterprise. The higher you go up, naturally, generally, the higher the the deal value. Therefore, you're doing less deals, more complex to get to your million pound. And that's the bit. I like the middle ground. I like the busy, tr- a few more deals, but actually a level of complexity in the, what you're selling. So it gets, <clears throat> I don't know, the the rejection gets less because you are getting deeper and deeper into the business, business departments, the business problems. You're starting to understand exactly what the drivers are to, to even buy whatever you're selling, the solution that you're selling. So it's it, it really depends. I don't know what you're selling. So what are we selling? Um, virtual tours. Virtual tours. Virtual tours. So transact. Tran- Videography. So I had a, a sh- sh- tra- transactional and product is a big thing as well, right? D- product is a big thing. So if you, there are loads of solution enterprise sales people that are selling dog shit solutions, highly competitive. It, it, yeah, uh, it was you know it was business to business. You'd be hitting high chills, high high street stores. Mm-hmm. Um, all day, every day, yeah. and you'd be going into somewhere where um, they may have had one or two people in trying to sell exactly the same thing that yeah. day or the day yeah. before or two days before. And plus, these businesses, uh, high street stuff, they have people walking trying to sell them shit all yeah. the fucking time, even if it works. Some of them just have this, have this, you know. You're not, they just, they've got this stigma against anyone who walks yeah. in trying to sell them You're stuff. a salesperson. And plus, in order to make those sales, you need to be walking in and you need to be speaking to the person who run, owns the business, the mo- the authority behind the money. Yeah. And half the time, you're not. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's just volume. You had to hit, yeah. you just had to hit 40, 50, you had to do in the region of 40, 50 pitches a day yeah. to hit your target. Hardcore, and hardcore hard, sales. Yeah, and your target would be one or two sales a day. Yeah. You think that rejection rate? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I actually, I, I, I don't. I, I went through that. It, not to that extent, but I went through that when I first left. I wanted to get into technology sales. The background is my brother was is Royal Artillery. He's a, he's a he was a sapper. He left as a sapper. Definitely wasn't a sapper. A gunner. Um, my sister's a sapper. He left as a gunner. No GCSEs. Six years he did. I think he had like an uninspiring military career, but he got out and he's now VP sales, vice president of sales for um, a big British technology unicorn. And he, I saw what he was doing and I saw, and I knew about the space. I knew about solution selling, commercial B2B, business to business. So I, that's why I levitated towards that. But that, what you're saying there, that's like, that's like cutting your teeth, like, learning that's like hardcore sales i don't know if i could do that for a long period of time because that level of rejection must be hard yeah it was it was our uh, yeah like i said shit time in life i had very, uh, very little other options um but i tell you what i did i mean you talk about cutting you see i t- can you see tell you what i <laughs> probably the only thing i found useful about it was um you should go into somewhere and you're having to on the spot try and decide what kind of person it is you're about to pitch to yeah. Yeah, and then how how to adjust that pitch, how to then on the on you know on the fly through the conversation weave it to where you want it to weave it because yeah. sometimes it starts off straight negative, yeah. you know, and it's just getting it to getting it to where you want it to go if you can. And it's, it's manipulation. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's out, Psychology. It's, it's like the, the whole yeah. of like sales yeah. is that. Yeah, yeah. Completely agree. <clears throat> and that's like think think about it from a military perspective. I talked I talk to, like, the whole point of redeployable is to help ex-service people, serving service people move into commercial roles. That's the whole game. So th- I talk to people about this all the time, but you think about it mil- from a military perspective. What do you do when you walk into a room with, if you're a, f- you're a full screw and you walk into a room with, full of full screws, you act, act like a bit more relaxed, whereas you walk into a room with a staff here, you're a bit different. You walk into a room with a colonel, you're a bit different, and you, like, mirror, th- you, uh, you re- adapt to the situation quickly, and and that's the same. It's the same in sales. You you adapt to situations based on the people that you're selling to. And sometimes you you've got a curveball, and someone comes into a call that is the owner of the business of a hundred million pound business, and you've got to adapt to that situation. And I think military people are quite well set up to to deal with it. I think that you adapt to situations quickly, and it's one of them key attributes that I talk to software companies about all the time who I'm 
fundamentally selling military people too is is like the the transferable skills are there for what we do like resilient you said about resilience 40 pitches a day and you you maybe got two sales like you've got to have a a pretty high level of resilience to be able to deal with them 38 rejections because it's just hardcore hardcore all day that same enthusiasm on your 39th pitch as you did on your first pitch or else you're not going to sell and that's the i think that's the whole, whole thing about it i i love it i'm i'm enjoying i'm sold on sales i'd enjoy it if it didn't have the pressure so at the time yeah. I, when i when i was doing it <clears throat> the organization i was doing it for most of those people yeah th that's not a job for a 30-something-year-old no. person who need, who's got a certain income they need to hit. Loads of pressure, you know, to just to be able to pay the bills. That's something, someone that is maybe at home for six weeks in yeah. the summer living with the parents. 100%. Do you know what yeah. I mean? And most of the people, that's who most of the people were there. They were young doing it. And in that case, the pressure really good. One of the, do you know one of the interesting things I, I learned about it too is, um, is... It, it, it's really it was really not because of the frequency of going and meeting different people and you're really being conscious of the way you act when you walk in was the inbuilt I don't want to say discrimination but the inbuilt variances in how you we do things depending on who we're looking at yeah so on a baseline level if I walked into a business and it was a woman there yeah. as in when I say woman as in that's the first people person I know I'm going to speak to because it might not be the fucking boss but that's uh, was that my phone? Yeah, sorry. Um, compared to if it was a business with a, if it was a business, it was a man. I could see the first people speak to. Subconsciously, I was I was already changing the way I was doing yep. things and how, fr and that's from the way I walk in to the tone of voice I'm using yep. to the posture I adopt when I'm speaking to them at the counter or at the desk or whatever it is. Or and that's without me. That's without any of the sales training bit. Yep. It's just what you do. And I noticed that as well when I was doing a lot of bar work. Yeah. So sometimes you end up, you know, people end up talking to you, or you end up in a conversation at the bar with someone. And the way I would engage, again, I'm using the male, female thing, just as it's the, it's the most basic difference in people that you can, you know, you can see you're going to maybe communicate in different ways. You know, I would communicate with a man a completely different way, a different way to communicate to a woman. Because that's kind of sales as well, right? In the bar. You know, you don't want to be a knob. Yeah. You know, you want to encourage people to like you in a way to want to spend more money to buy another pint to keep, do you know what I mean yeah, all yeah. Those, it's the same it's the same thing very weird we all have these inbuilt discrimination things about us yeah. positive or negative discriminations it's natural isn't it yeah it's and I think, I think people think idealistically think yeah we shouldn't have that we need to get away from that yeah. well good good luck Good luck getting rid of that of that evolutionary trait that's kept us alive for thousands of years. <laughs> it's the mo it's, it's the most important like first ten minutes of a sales call uh, of a sales call. I think is the first ten minutes of of a call with a customer. Is like people look for points of how we relate to each other. So you walk into a room and you're like, whatever you tell me initially, it's like a, a good example is I, I I did a pitch to like 150 service leavers not long ago. And first slide, I I was I would with a, a lot of other businesses but my first slide was like me me and my wife my kid my dog my camper van working at the camper van because my theory is like out of that 150 people on that call 80 90 percent of them are going to relate, relate to something on that slide <laughs> it's the reality though right yeah it's yeah. like you always look and people message me after it saying oh thanks for the pitch love the camper van right sweet so you i've got a camper van and that's like people are just People, you look for things that you can relate to in your life. Other people, whether it's you like exercising, you like rugby, you like football, you're interested in Stalin. Do you know what I mean? Just, do you, do you, you, you know what I'm coming from. You just, you, you just do naturally, I think. And that's the whole. Sales is a psychological thing as well. Everyone buys emotionally, I think, in a way. People, people I hate the word people buy from people, but it helps if you're not a dick when you're selling to someone because people will naturally levitate to you and listen to you at, at least and at least hear what you've got to say um so yeah i get I, you're correct like i think you will naturally speak in different ways to different people and you'll just have to quickly come up with it right when you when you're walking into a store it must have been tough to be like okay this person's a shop assistant she's female she's 45 and now you're probably going to speak to her in a different way than if she was 25 shop assistant female or if it was a bloke or it's yeah it's it's uh it's interesting i find it interesting from, like from mm. the psychology perspective is that why you is that why sales interested that is that the main reason 
because it's psychological perspective, or is it? Because there, there, there are all sorts that, yeah, it's, it's like there's like a science to it. I think it's not just about it's not just about the you need to understand the customer for there's what is the bit one of the big things understand the customer's day to day because the problem that your solution solves for the customer they may have they could have 10 15 20 problems in the business now what are the why are they deciding on which is the highest priority in the in the business they manage things from risk revenue cost like all these things come into play so you've like you're navigating the whole business in a way understanding it from the customer's perspective and then you're trying to figure out whether your solution can solve some of the challenges that they're calling out, what who the decision makers are, what they care about, what the people that you're speaking to care about. So there's just it's just it's a it's a challenge to navigate. But when you you like you back to what you originally where we started this conversation, if you lose if you lose a deal after all that work, it's hard because you might you might only be work, working on five, 10 different deals and you, you spent a lot of time on one, you lose it. But it's having the resilience then to pick yourself back up because you will win, naturally win if you're doing the right job and you're understanding the business properly, you'll win, you'll win some of these deals. And then when you win some of the deals in technology space, that generally means that a good upside, you earn, you earn a, a good chunk of money doing it, so. You work in software sales, right? Yeah, I'm yeah, I'm head of sales for a software company. Yeah, and London. redeployable is predominantly around software sales. Redeployable, um, redeployable came about because of redeployable is about getting <coughs> service people into technology sales. Tech sales. Yes. Okay, with your sales experience and understanding and knowledge at the moment. Yeah. How much is uh, how much attention is being paid to blockchain tech and how that might change the face of the software market? Blockchain tech. What do you mean by that? Blockchain mm. technology. So decentralized, decentralized applications based on the blockchain. I've got no Don't idea. Know. Okay, let's no, step no, off no, that. No, I've got concept. no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I could try and spin you some bullshit. I, I, I def, I'm <laughs> definitely spin not. Spin me some bullshit. Give me a sales no, pitch. Go on, I'm do not, it. I'm not going to do that. Sell I'm me. I, I sell with integrity. <laughs> <laughs> I sell with integrity. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah, no. Don't know the, I okay. don't know the answer. If I, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. What should, <laughs> what should go on to that? That fucking shit. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't want. Yeah, I, I don't know enough about the subject to to go deep. So That's fine, I'll try not to. Um. Yeah. So I, right, redeployable isn't just software. Then it's tech in general. Software is what I know. Like in terms of. Uh, the different industries that I've been working in selling specific software. But let, let's not forget, like, with technolo technology sales, you don't need to be a tech software expert. I don't know how to write. I don't know how to code. I don't know how to write integrations. I'm not. I'm not. I've got people who support me in that area. We've got tech teams. I generally just need to understand the customer. Generally, I just need to understand the pain points of the customer, and I generally just need to understand what our solution can do for them, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. It's one of the miscon I think it's one of the misconceptions that a lot of people have. Um, a lot of people, a lot of service leaders have, because and it's due to their misunderstanding or, or lack of experience within the Civi world, which yeah. most have, not all. So we were talking about, in my site earlier, yeah. Satcom's company, <clears throat> if you'd said to me 15 years ago, even 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to be working as a project manager in, uh, in my SAT. What's in my SAT? Satellite communications. I'd be like, <laughs> mate, I ain't got a clue about SAT comms. <laughs> I, was, no, I wasn't even like a radio up, you know, like two radio, none of that, no clue. But what I know now is you don't need to have that baseline knowledge of yeah. SAT comms in this example to go and work in a SAT comms company. You know, it's, uh, you just need to, uh, like you were saying there, so in this, I work now in, Funny enough, software development is my yeah. job. Um, project managing software development. So are you angling the blockchain technology question at me? From no, the, there's nothing to do with it. Nothing to no, do with no, 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 I'm no. just interested at the moment. Um, uh, so my, you know, uh, the, even though it's software development, which I have a, re I have a real basic um, amateur, amateur experience with coding and stuff like that, um, for over the years, but I don't have it at the level <laughs> these yeah. flipping lunatics at work are doing it, right? Um, but I don't need to have it at first. You sort of learn it along the way. My role as a project manager, I'm just, I am just 
ushering the work forward, coordinating what needs to be done and make sure it's all done properly, right? And you pick up bits and pieces along the way. And it, it must be the same. Well, it will be the same within your know, software. Like you're saying, to go and sell the product, you don't need to know the, the nitty-gritty details of how the product works, each line of code involved in that bit of software, every single thing it can be integrated into. Like you're saying, you just need to know arguably the high level the high level points now it can solve for the for the customer which is you know which is important because it means that things like satcoms things like all these industries we think i ain't never fucking going into that it's not you can go into you can go into anything you want to go into it's just understanding that a satcoms company for example isn't made up entirely of engineers yeah you know of data geeks it's it's, it's. I mean, it's like the, it's like uh, it's like a battle group analogy. So um, I've never thought of this analogy before, but this is what it's like. So a battle, you know, a battle group goes on the ground. The battle, the the, the majority of that battle group is this other support elements to enable the fighting element to go and fight. Three power battle group was, you know, when I went out, where I went out with, be six or seven hundred of three power, as in the fighting troops, and then. The rest of the 2,000 or however big that battle group was, they were all support arms. They were there to enable it. And that's the same as any company works. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's uh, see, that's a good, it's a good analogy. Thank you. I'm gonna it's a that. great, it's a great <laughs> analogy. It's, it's. I'm definitely not the smartest person in in a software company by any means. Like there are, everything about software is about initially market. You got a marketing team, so they're the ones who are pushing out what information about the 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 product. It, they understand the customer, they understand the messaging, they know what we were talking about social earlier on, weren't we? So, so understand where to market the product because <coughs> who's your target audience? So they do all of that kind of market mapping. Then you get your leads in, which are your potential opportunities. Then you've got salespeople, jun- like entry-level salespeople usually, who would be then going across those leads and like understanding, well, what do they want? What do they need? And they'll have a checklist of, is this a good opportunity? They'll then pass that on to someone who works the deal, understands the intricacies, understands the departments, understands the drivers. They sell it, and then that's just the start for a software company. That's that's securing a customer. The whole point of a software company is like realizing lifetime value of a customer, so keeping that customer happy for uh, five years, whatever the, the 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 term is. So then you've got a customer success team who man. Uh, uh, really just like account managers, if you will. They're just like always making sure the customer's happy, trying to sell them more if they can sell them more. Um, but then even sit behind that, you've got operations, business operations, you've got all of the developers, all the clever, smart, coding people, you've got chief technical officers, you've got all sorts of people that are... The sales of the infantry, right, I think. If you, if in that analogy, like you, you, you're going out there selling it and everyone else is supporting you to sell it. So yeah, it's a yeah. great, it's a good analogy. I like it. Yeah. What um, what's the, what's the most challenging aspect of sales? Do you think? Um, you always you need to you need to be always on, isn't it? You don't matter if you if you if you do have a good month, you could do two hundred percent of your target. It's I generally think it's just forgotten about the month after. You need to go and do it again, and do it again, and do it again, and do it again. And that is a demanding job, but that's why you get paid. You get paid good money for it because it's demanding. So you're always on. So it's a hard job to switch off. That's been one of my biggest challenges. Hence the reading about stoicism and <laughs> trying to manage my time better. And <laughs> it's just true. I've got, I've got quite a. I'd say I'm quite a hard proactive personality in general. So to to turn myself off from it is tough. I find it turning work off tough. You're quite a what hard pra- high high, high proactive high high pra- yeah I'm quite oh, hyperactive yeah high proactive oh, yeah yeah. So I find it difficult to, to to stop, sometimes. Yeah, I think most people do in this mm. day and age. Don't they? I think. Well, maybe, or maybe not. Yeah. Again, it goes back to that bombardment of information. Homeworking. Yeah. I mean, my experience with salespeople, uh, um, over the over time, enterprise level and down to grassroots, is that hyperactivity. They always mm. seem manic, or or mm. some of them do. I think it's a good. It's a good point thinking about it now. Actually, now I come across a mix. You get some who are like this mega chilled, like, and then you get others who are manic, yeah. constantly, and everything needs to be done at the drop of a hat. Everything yeah. is immediate. I need it now. I yeah. need it now. I'm not that, but I my personality is hyperactive. I'm busy. I'm just. Mm. I think I'm just busy all the time. The 
you do, you don't need to be hyperactive. You don't even need to be extrovert to be a salesperson. You just need to be, I think. I don't know. I I think that I think that is for me personally. That's the hardest bit, switching off. But that's just because of my mindset about I want to be really successful. That's my my aim is to be really successful. So I'm always thinking about what do I need to do? What do I need to? What are, what are everyone? What's everyone else doing right now? Well, ev- what's our competition doing? Our competition are probably working, so I probably should carry on working. That's my mindset. Whereas some people, even my, even my brother, his brother's way more experienced in sales than me. He's chilled. He's not. He know. He's in, he knows the game. He's he's more relaxed than I am. But he's, but a good but a good technology salesman as well so have yeah. you got many of your old colleagues from the, from the mill into the into sales um so yeah we it's yeah but i mean this is the whole point of redeployable so i i um i i've seen the upside over the last four years i got out in 2017 i knew about technology sales because my brother but n- none of my friends know about it and they're all smart people i'm not special i know i'm not special for coming out of the military and I've done really, really well. Earned more money than I could have ever imagined doing it in four years. And I helped a friend who's an ex-avionics tech get a shitty role, to be honest. He, he, but he wanted it. He was in Dubai. He loves going. He loves Dubai. So he wanted. I coached him through it. And I've never been able to help people in that way by coaching them through it. And he got this job and he was chuffed. And I, I and the more and more of my friends are coming to ask me about how do I get into this? How do I get into this? Because I think the status quo is going into an operational role or going into project management or going into health and safety, which is fine. But there are other things out there for people. And the more and more friends came to me, the more I didn't really have like a structured way of helping them transition into the commercial world. So that's the reason why. That's the reason why I founded founded Redeployable. Are there any... Uh, have you ever- have you come across any units yet? And you think, oh my God, most of the people who come from this unit are just not suited to this kind of thing. Come on. No, no not, not specific. <laughs> not specific. <laughs> I mean, targeted because we know we all know that the, re- the reams, the ream is the best core. So, I mean, naturally go after the reams. But no, no, not really. I mean, you can't. The, I'm obviously t- <laughs> you're in deep water. Yeah, yeah. Come on, <laughs> give me a break, you. <laughs> Now, what's uh, redeployable, right? Starting your own business, not easy, not easy at all. Tons of pressure. We're talking about we're talking about pressure on being a salesperson, yeah. but a pressure on starting a business from scratch and needing that to be successful for one, your own livelihood, yeah. two, your sanity, three, because it is arguably well, you see it as a reflection. Some some people do see it as a reflection on your own ability and state and. Uh, and, and reputation and everything so it's all that extra pressure you put yourself to succeed when the reality is most startups don't succeed yeah. don't succeed how have you found that how have you found the process of setting up redeployable and is, is it going better than you expected or is it where it needs to be yeah I don't think you can plan for anything I think there's not there's, there isn't really like a playbook I've found Something I've been thinking about, like, do you do you kind of like build the business in public in a way? Like, on I thought that might be a good way to help people is like talk about the decisions I make. I've I've been writing all the decisions I make out, and then maybe post about that on LinkedIn or something like that to help people who have been in the military. But I think there might be organisations to help, but you can't plan like where I, what I originally thought versus where I'm at now is just is just different. You're making decisions that you've never made before. It's uncomfortable, but that. I, I don't know. I, I, it's your own. Do you know? Do you know what I mean? It's you. You. It's your. It's your business. You making the decisions. You live by the sword. You die by the sword. And I. I like that aspect of it. I like the. I like the risk of it. I think if you've got a good enough business plan and there's a problem and there's a need in the market, I think. Would I regret not doing it? And the answer was always, yeah. I would regret not doing it if I didn't do it now. So that's why. That's why I did it. What is the need in the market you're addressing? Um, so, co- I mean, it, this is a thing before COVID. Uh, the 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 demand for good techni- technology salespeople outweighs supply. It's the reality. So you've got all of these big businesses like your Amazons, and you'll know about the military recruitment side. Your Amazons, your Microsofts, they're all Armed Forces Covenant members. They've all got military recruitment teams. You've got this whole wave of like there are what there are ten businesses, not even that, five businesses of Amazons or just smaller than Amazon size, big corporations. 
who are going after the military. And then you've got all of this tail end of smaller businesses, still big businesses, who aren't tapping into the the military market, like the 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 people that are getting out. And my argument is we're always looking for good salespeople. It's they're, they're a commodity. And there are so many good ex mill people get getting out or have are out who'd be who'd kill it. They'd kill it in sales role. They just need a bit of training. That's all they why need. Why do you think that? Why 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 do you think this? Because I mean, even if I just look at my I said to you earlier on that I, I don't think I, the army was a calling for me. The one thing that was a calling for me in the army was the people that I met, like my mates, my, my network, the, the t- top people, awesome people, personable, in, loads of integrity, like a big thing in sales. You've got to have integrity. You don't oversell. You don't promise things you can't kind of deliver on. So all they, they've just got this, a lot of the army people that I know have got this resilience in them. They've got this integrity. They've got this, like, Work ethic that no, I'm not stereotyping civ- civ- civvies because civvies, there's some great civvies as well. I met some awesome civvies out, but just generally, a lot of the people that I meet are that, that and, and that's what you need in sales, tech sales. You need that, you need that work ethic, you need that resilience, you need that hunger, you need to be adaptable to situations. And for me, like you'd learn that even in, if you only do five years, six years in the army, you, you learn that. In doing your time and it's just about for me it's just about helping them to get to a point where if i then find them roles in technology sales that they've they've got that base level reskilled them to that base level where they're trained to a point where they can talk speak the language and then w- working with some of these software companies who are going to support them because you, you've got to give them ramp time you've got to train them as well you've got to give them a chance because the coachable they're adaptable. You just need to give them a bit of time and they'll be killing it in no time. And that's, I guess that's the, I don't know where, where you, what your original question was. You have lost the question. <laughs> it's gone all passionate. Why, uh, it's that coffee. It's that coffee. <laughs> why, I, uh, the question was, uh, why do you think um, a lot of XML are so suited to sales? But you, you answered it. You know? Yeah. You're right. Uh, adaptability, flexibility, thinking on the fly. A lot of, I don't, <clears throat> Would I be right in saying that? Because uh, I don't profess to be any experience in sales in what any way, shape, or form. There's a lot of onus on on the individual, the salesperson, to uh, to take on responsibility to make some key decisions for themselves in time pressured situations, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly that. So you, so you're you're pretty autonomous. I work from home since I left left the army. I travel, which is good. It suits me. I like I like to. S- to travel to go you know meet customers i've been abroad but predominantly i've got an office in my garden i've worked out my office in the garden for for the last three years you manage your own time you manage your own diary the the key factor is your target you've got a target set sometimes the target's unrealistic but it's my my job will be redeployable to make sure that i'm placing people in in roles that the targets are realistic that's your target so they're not going to say you need to work nine hours a day they're not going to say you need to work 15 hours you can work three hours if you can hit your target that, that's the game that's what that i love but then if you think about back to army like you you go on an exercise my, my sister's a good example she's in poland at the minute she got told end of november that she's going to poland for this whole everything that's going on so she just got told beginning of december you're missing christmas you're going to poland and now she's they don't know how long they're going to be there that extra work that she's got to do that decision there there's not really any upside you, you're gonna she's gonna promote and the people out there they're gonna promote generally the same pace they, they, they're gonna get the re- reports they might do a d- good job out there which is gonna maybe help them promote but the game in sales is if you're not capped at 100 percent, you you can do you can sell more and earn more and the more you sell the more you earn because it's commission based as well as having like this base salary so like I always went into it with that mindset. Like, how, how do forget my hundred percent target? Like, what's what's can I earn? What's two hundred percent? What's two hundred fifty percent? How can I get to that? And that mindset has got me like hundred percent is a nothing number. Like, do you know what I mean? You push through. If you set your targets high, you push through the the low end and get to the, kind of the higher target. So that that's what a big big uh, thing for me. Mm. Just the effort you put in. Right. Explain to me how redeployable works. Yeah, so um, so re- I mean, it's founded with my sister. She's still serving. Um, oh, she founded it. So or with your sister. So I, I sat on the I with my sister. She didn't find it. I, 
I originally, I've been sitting on the idea for two years. I'm in technology sales. My brother's in technology sales. Um, and I wanted to get my, my sister's getting out of the army in 14 months. She, they don't know that yet. She's going to sign up in two months. Is this, <laughs> is this going out? Oh shit, I just dropped it. No, no, she, she's, um, she's getting out in, in 14 months. I don't think she'll mind me saying that. We'll see. Um, yeah, she's getting out in 14 months and she would be awesome in technology sales. She's, she'd be amazing. She's, she's more capable than both my brother and I. Like she's, she's an operator. She's good. Um, and she's like, well, how, where should I go? What should I do? And I was like, let's just, let's just pull the trigger on this. Let's go and do this. How do you know she's mega at sales? I, I just know L- Lucy is, is annoyingly good at everything. Everything. Okay. Everything she's ever done. Shout Lucy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, she's not going to, she's going to kick off at work now, aren't they, after this? <laughs> uh, no, she's, she's good. She, I know, I know for a fact that I'm, I'm pretty confident in everything that she does because she just, do, she just dominates everything. She's good. So I, I, I would have always helped to transition, but then I just thought we're, so, we're so alike in terms of like the way we think, the things that piss us off, how we, we're the most alike out of our old family. So I was like, well, why, why not just go and do this together? And it's going to give her that springboard when she gets out. Whereas like we're, if we're in business together, I think it's going to be, it'd be pretty cool. So. So yeah, I've lost. You've lost my question. You hadn't asked me your original no, it's question. Right. It's gone. That's right. Um, it was uh, how does redeployable work? Yeah. So we so we uh, service leavers come to us, or we sometimes speak to service leavers. The whole thing of this is an education piece as well. Like you said, you didn't know about comms and things like before you went to Im- Imasat. It's the same with a lot of these uh, these these service leavers. People who've been out, they don't really know what. Did you know what? Technology business to business sales was when you were leaving the army. You would have sent a B to me, B to B to me. I wouldn't have had a clue what B to B was. Yeah, yeah. So business to business, like, not it's an education thing first. So I'm actually just explaining to people that there are other options where you can get paid a, a lot of money if you do well, um, and it's you're autonomous. All the things that we've been talking about. So we find those. Uh, we then train train them. So we, I've got a scholarship program with a San Francisco-based uh, sales training company. Um, I'm speaking with some big, big corporate businesses to to work with them to put training packages together. So we've just had a, the first guy, just uh, ex Air Tech, Air Tech, works for I won't say because I'm going to drop him in it if I say he works for a civilian big uh, engineering company. He's just been through the first sales development rep scholarship. Um, he's now in. He's now in three taking three interviews at the moment with software companies that yeah. I'm working with. So he's been through the scholarship. We put people through the scholarship. I then, put, being a sales guy, I, I'm then working with a number of se- uh, software sales companies, technology sales companies, not specifically software, but a lot of software companies. My responsibility here is that I find the right companies for the the mill people getting out because I know there's some shitty companies out there and I I'm I'm feel like I'm personally invested in, making sure that these people are you know it's from the the military network i i want to make sure that they're they're in a position where they've got that baseline base knowledge training but then a good company we're going to support them to make sure that they're successful because you can put them into some bear pits uh if if you were if you were responsible with it so finding them good companies and then after uh, we place them we then we're then building like a post placement community so all be online. So veterans who have moved into sales. So I've been speaking to loads of vets who have moved into this, into the commercial world, um, and then building out a mentorship program. So away from the businesses that we place them in. So I place someone in a software business. They'd have a mentor who's outside of that business, who's an ex, is a vet who's in sales, who they can use as a sounding board. One meet once a month, uh, if it's a coffee, it's virtually whatever it is, and just use those people as sounding boards. So they kind of support them throughout the career. Um, so that's the that's the plan. You mentioned just now about companies who you know there's there's shit companies out there who won't who won't look after maybe not look after the people you want to yeah. put into them. Give me an example. How would they not? What? Like, they're, they're, again, a number of, number of things we talked about target earlier on. So it's setting unrealistic targets <laughs> happens. So you, if you think like th- sales is split down into in two fa- there's two factors. You have got your base salary. You, that's your guarantee. You, you'll sp- if it's 30k you'd be spread over 12 months and you'd be paid that every month it could be 80k it could be 120k whatever it is then you've got your commission which is your linked to your target so you you sell 100% and you'll get paid 100% of your commission is the is the 
is the, is the game. Both of those together is it's called your on-target earnings. So your on-target earnings is your base plus your commission to get your on-target. They'll sell the on-target earnings to people. So your OTE, they call it abbreviate OTE. They'll they'll sell that to you. But how realistic is the 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 target? Is ah, the... so I see what you're saying. So if they're setting an unrealistic target, and they say, yeah, you're gonna your target is gonna be. I don't. Know, I'm hypothesizing you. Yeah. Uh, 100k sales in in the, this quarter yeah but really so so they can say the and let's say your baseline is i don't know make it easy 12 grand a month no no 12 grand a year that's a grand a year, that's a grand a month right yeah so you're i'm um, talking shit yeah but anyway I mean, anyway, I mean. anyway yeah so your on target earnings are going to be are going to sound huge yeah. because they've doubled what your what your target is actually going to, what your target actually should yeah. be. So they say, yeah, you're, instead of your your target being 100k sales in the quarter, yeah. realistically, they know the max you're going to hit is 50k because the market may not be big. Make it be you. The money not, may not be a terrible market. product. Yeah, yeah. Or it could be a terrible product. You can, yeah, make, yeah. you can have video software that doesn't video. And they do that so they can attract in numbers of sales people to increase their likelihood of selling right they sell the OT the OT is the dream right yeah the OT on, on target earnings is the dream that's when you want to get to you want to get to 100% of your target so you get your OT you, you could be on 60k basic over a year guaranteed but they'll sell it at 120k OTE 50-50 generally 60-40 mm. 50-50 is what you're looking at you should be looking at 50-50 I think but it might not be achievable. So you're already set up for failure. So you're not going to hit 120,000. So what they're doing is they're attracting more experienced salespeople in 120,000 OTE, but the reality is they might be paid 70,000, which is still good. But if you get if you get deeper into technology sales, you know that 70,000 for someone who's experienced at, at, at winning business is not, that's not a big wedge. How can you sniff that out then with, with companies who are doing that? You got to do your research, and this is how this is. Are you, are you? We talk about this quite a lot with the the people that we're working with. Is like okay, so there, you got to be a bit of a detective. So there's a whole whole number of things you can look at. So you can look at tenure of people on on LinkedIn. How long are people in roles for? How long do people promote in? How long do people stay? How many open job roles have they got? Why have they got so many open job roles? Ask the question when you're interviewing. What percentage of your sales team are hitting the target right now? That's a good question. Because it doesn't matter if it's 120k OTE or 200k OTE, if 32% of your sales team are hitting the number, that's not, it doesn't matter. Because, mm. do you know what I mean? So yeah. there is, there's sneaky ways and they might give you equity share. They might give you, like, they'll, they'll layer in different things to try and attract more and more people because it's back to that point. What's the market need? The market needs the market is demanding the supply of good technology people, but the supply isn't there. Therefore, they, everyone's doing everything they can to, to attract good talent. And whether that's raising the OTE, 150, 200K. So there's a massive demand at the minute for salespeople in the tech space. Oh, yeah. G good salespeople in the tech space. Definitely. Why, why, why is there a lack of supply? Well, there's, it's, it's a tough job. We talked about that. It's not, it's not the easiest job in the world. And I, I'll never say to the people that we work with that it's an easy job you've got to be committed to it but again potential upside is huge but the it's just a, it's just it's just a it's just a hard end there's two i mean what's covid done for t to technology in the last two and a half years it's accelerated it by what it, it's not just salespeople that are short in the whole digital space you've got people like sales forces of the world sages your microsoft's all of these big companies, SAP, Oracle, they're all training people for free. So you, you look at um, Salesforce, awesome tool, Trailhead it, it is a great tool. It's a free training, uh, free train, Trailhead. Trailhead. Trailhead, yeah. So Salesforce, I mean, Salesforce is huge. Like Trailhead, I think there's like 200 people in their training wing Explain alone. Explain what Salesforce is for people who don't know. Sorry, so Salesforce is, uh, is one of like the original soft <laughs> the dog's enjoying the the treat uh, is one one of the original kind of sales uh, software companies out there big huge software company big corporation but they have like uh, veteran schemes military spouse schemes where as they will 
provide loads of different training courses to train people up because what they want to do is they want to train military people up and even if they don't employ them they're that big that they've got a community of people who use their software who need users and skilled people in that specific software so they'll train you and hope that you go out into the community to start kind of feeding back into their company so there's a gap i think there's a technology gap full stop right now mm, loads of industries have been unexpectedly uh, have experienced unexpectedly a boom from the pandemic mm. got the air con you're in a studio i got that getting that surface i fitted that see i didn't right completely off tangent yeah i didn't know you can't you can't fit you're not allowed to fit air con yourself no you you can fit air con yourself but i'm not allowed to buy an air con unit from a company uh, sorry Back. A company, fucking hell, one of bullshit stories is right, I'll get there. So, a company who sells aircon units, like as in fitted aircon units, like that one, they are not allowed to sell to the direct to the consumer unless they are fitting it. So, they have to fit it too. I bought it off the back of a lorry, I didn't know that. I fitted it. Anyway, long story short, uh, try to get the aircon guy in for ages to, to service it because. Me and a guy called Tony Shannon, who's ex Remy captain, came in to fit. I mean, I'll tell you, the c- comedy, comedy, <laughs> comedy fitness thing, right? Uh, got them in eventually to do the aircon service, and we were chatting. And he was, I was like, I was business. He said, Man, I've, just, I've got too much, I've got too much, I can't handle it. So, why? He said, because it's gone, aircon has gone through the fucking roof from the pandemic, and it's domestic aircon. Yeah. People who are now working from home, they're home all the time, and the kids are at home and all that, they are just fitting air con to the house here. It's like it's gone out of fashion. But also, they don't know what they're doing. So he given he just come from a place, finished off a house. This house was like a five-bed townhouse, and the family had fitted an air con unit to every single room. Every room. <laughs> mental. Mental. <laughs> so that's five air con units, which need servicing twice a year, Right. Just one is like 80 quid or 100 quid to get service. They've got five now, plus the power draw, plus that it's probably not being used properly. You know the kids are going to the bedroom and having the air con on 24-7. You know what I mean? Because the air con, it doesn't just heat, uh, just cool, it heats. So yeah, but anyway, example, air con, through the fucking roof because of yeah. the pandemic. Tech, through the roof because of the pandemic. Satcoms, certain elements of satcoms, well, granted, aviation went through the floor, so... No, because yeah. there was no planes flying, so people weren't using the Wi-Fi, but when, you know, on the planes and other other stuff that SATCOMs used for on planes. But like enterprise ground, gr- like land-based comms, went through the roof because you couldn't, for example, easily send an employee to go and check a piece of equipment and re- get the data reading if it was an area with a lockdown. So all of a sudden, they had to get a way of reading these pieces of equipment remotely where there's no telephone signal, for example. Telephone signal. Phone signal, for example. Mobile signal. Satcoms. Other places. Yeah, sales. Anyway, I went off a right tangent there. That's yeah, my aircon yeah. story. You, uh, you're right. I like uh, to get the aircon story. It's impressive. Right. It's, it's impressive exciting. You, it's I might write it down. It. I might write it down. Yeah, yeah it is impressive that you fit it. I got someone to fit my aircon. <laughs> so you're much better than I am. I know, but I fitted it. Right, so. we. I fitted it in. Wired it all up. Right? <clears throat> all the, I, like, I'm, I like to learn how to do stuff myself. Yeah. Like as much as I can, even when it comes to mains electricity, which isn't the wisest. I was yeah. at myself twice, not on the aircon. We put it in, and I realized that um, you needed a specialist piece of equipment to create a vacuum in the system the first time you started up. I got on the phone to Tony Shan and I went, Tony, because, uh, you know, read me, switched on. He'll have all the tools, he'll know everything. So, Tony, he goes, Yeah, I, I've got yeah, I've got something. I'll come down, I've got something I can create a vacuum, come down. So, he comes down. We get the kit out, and what he's brought is, see, you know, <laughs> you know the machines that you plug into the car to blow up, for example, a paddle board yeah. or a yeah, 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 yeah. He brought one of these, right? <laughs> uh, but it's all right, because it, you can reverse the flow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, on the aircon, it's like proper brass fittings. You've got to, you had to increase, you had to create a vacuum up to a certain, a certain PSI where we had no way of reading it. And we ended up, and the nozzle didn't fit anyway because it's for fucking airbags. <laughs> so we just stick it on. We wrapped black and nasty around it. So we switched on the aircon, create, created what we thought was a vacuum. Um, like, yeah, that'll Did do. Work? Like two minutes, that'll do. No, we took it off. It worked for about 12 hours and then just fucking pumped in. Yeah, it wouldn't heat. 
Remy Captain. Remy Captain. Tony yeah. Shannon. He's a patron as well. Shout yeah. out to Tony for um, helping me not install the, air, the uh, aircon, <laughs> illegal aircon. <laughs> Correctly. I'm I'm terrible. I just I just outsource <laughs> everything. Do you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I can't no, stand doing my it. My wife gives me grief for it. it. I can't stand doing yeah. that. I want to do everything myself. Oh no, I'm, I'm the opposite. So I like quite it. happily outsource it if I can. Anything. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I I mean I can see the benefit of why you're doing it. Why you want to do it? I learned a lot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Useless knowledge. Yeah, I'm just gonna say I've got no interest in learning about <laughs> fitting air color. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fucking hell. Anyway, um, right. How long is the... So explain just the process. So a service lever comes to redeployable. They listen to this. Or, or anyone. if or anyone. Like maybe not just gone out the service. Maybe like you said, been out six years, 10 years, whatever, want to change. Or maybe are they in and thinking about getting out and not sure what to do? Yeah. Can they come to you for advice? Yeah. So they get in touch. Um, they're, let's say they're out already. What What happens... What happens then? They're interested. And then, were you talking about courses they attend? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there, there's two things there. So, that they'll, we'll generally have a chat with them to understand yeah. the drivers, uh, like why they want to move. Because, like, you, working from home isn't, shouldn't be the only driver for moving into technology sales. There's a bit more to it than that. <laughs> sometimes so, sometimes is the main case. I just want to work from home. Yeah, I just want to work. I don't I just want to work from home. Yeah, there's a bit more. We need to probably need to talk about this a bit more. So there's just getting through that. Um, then the the scholarships that we're working on at the moment uh, are limited, which is which is frustrating. But they're scholarships. They're fifteen hundred pound courses for free. Um, so I'm working on that at the moment. You mean there's limited spaces? Limited spaces. Yeah, yeah correct. So I'm working with 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 uh, some big companies to build out training packages. The the aim is to be able to service you know ten twenty service leavers a month from a training perspective to do to work at a bit more volume because the the demand for moving in from the service leaver side is is quite high i think it's refreshing to see other options out there than than just your kind of your status quo if you will and um, so yeah they, they'd come in we, we check that they are the right fit because not everyone that's fine not everyone's the right fit for for the the space i i don't think um but likewise, I mean, we're not. I'm not a technical player. I'm not a coder. I wouldn't be right for that space either. So, just understanding where they are, then it's about getting them up to a, a good level, and understanding like what they want to do as well. Like everyone's feels like everyone. All the, a lot of the software companies that, or some of the software companies that I've spoken with, like bracket military people, is the same. When actually everyone's different. Everyone wants different things. Everyone. Some people want to support family. Some people want to travel all the time. Some people want a low wage because they sit they sitting on the on the pension. Some people want to go big and want to really commit ten years into something and you know get to the next level. So it's understanding what they want and then matching them with good companies, good companies who are looking for that type of person. Um, so there's a hole in between, but generally looking about a month, I think a month from the scholarships, a month in total, and then look at placing after that month. That's quite rapid. Yeah, yeah, it's it's um it's a four it's a four week course, yeah, four weeks, four sessions, loads of pre work, loads of coursework to do, yeah, it's good. Who put the course together? The the training company oh, in course, San Francisco. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. They they're like my, I they idolize or not idolize a training company. That's a bit sad, isn't it? But they're like the they're like my go to. They'd be my go to, uh, sales training company globally. So I just went directly to their bit of sales tactic. I know that their their founder has a camper van that he goes in. So I just of course went, he does. I went straight into the San Francisco based founder with a camper van and just sold to try to sell to him <laughs> that service leavers were the right move. <laughs> it worked. It worked. Well I didn't. He ignored me at first. Then I went to the whole team and then I came back up to the back up to the founder and he, he responded eventually. So mate. a bit of persistence. Persistence, mate. Yeah. Key. Yeah, yeah, mega. Um, right, where, uh, p- where where do people find out more? Redeployable.co.uk? Yeah, j- jump on our LinkedIn page. Find me. You can connect to me on LinkedIn, Ben Reed, R E A D. Um, my sister as well, Lucy Reed, R E A D again. Um, yeah, but we've, we're just building out our website at the moment. It should be out in the next couple of weeks. We've got a redeployable.co.uk holding page at the moment. Okay. So at the moment, best way is LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Then... Get it. Yeah, um, that's the only social media platform I really operate on right now. All right. Sweet. Anything we haven't covered that you want to cover? No. 
But I love your studio. It's class. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. The <laughs> coffee is as expected. <laughs> instant. In, instant. <laughs> like, I just felt myself just going off on crazy tangents. They're like, fucking, what's in this coffee? <laughs> What's in Ge- it's what's in Gez is the question. Well, I what mean, Gez? Gez with the coffee. Gez with the Gez plus coffee. Yeah. That was one of the most enjoyable podcasts I've listened to. That Gez one. <laughs> it was all the way up here. It's like great. I was, as soon as I started listening to him, I was like, I need to listen to all of this. <laughs> what do you think he'd be like as a salesperson? Um, I think he's got, obviously he's, he's good. He's a good talker, but I don't know if he'd. You've got to kind of you've got to listen to their point of view, and he gets. He gets, you could tell he's like the subject you're talking about he was like angry fucking annoys him doesn't Can it you imagine him letting oh. him loose like, oh god yeah loose. if if they yeah if, I think he'd have that much energy as well he'd be so invested in what he was selling oh yeah he would he would start swinging if they didn't buy it yeah the sw- <laughs> and the swinging bit don't work you need to work you need to walk away I think he'd be a good salesman but I'd, I mean I don't know you probably need to lay off the coffee a little bit like he's, <laughs> he's getting a bit intense there you go there you go right Ben, it's been an absolute pleasure. Cheers for time, mate. Right. And uh, good luck with what you're doing. Cheers, appreciate it. Oh, it's you. really important. Yeah, it's going to help a lot of people. Cheers. Appreciate it. No Thanks worries, for having mate. me. No worries. That's it. Thank you for watching the H Hour podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast and you haven't already done so, please subscribe here around about there. I'm hoping it's around about there where the button's going to appear. If not, if it's not already appeared. Uh, you can also, um, if you want to listen to the podcast, on your commute, for example, when you're driving, when it's not practical to watch the podcast, you can listen to it. It's on Spotify, it's on Apple Podcasts, it's on Google Podcasts, it's everywhere. It's on all of the uh, all of the common and not so common podcast apps. You can also, if you wish to do it, become a patron of Hey Hour. Becoming a patron of Hey Hour, you get access to all of the interviews before anyone else. So this interview with this guest was released days, if not weeks, before it was on release to the general public. And you also get access to... Uh, exclusive interviews which I do with each guest that last about five ten minutes that are based on questions that the patrons themselves of H Hour have chosen and each guest this one included gets asked those questions before the main podcast that's getting recorded it's like a pre-podcast interview lasts about 10 minutes and those interviews are really insightful really enjoyable nice and short and they only release the patrons they never get released to the public I don't know why I had a little stutter there um you also get access to a Discord community, exclusive Discord community only for patrons. You also get invited to a monthly Zoom call with myself and all the other patrons. And very often, most months, we have a previous podcast guest comes onto that Zoom call and has an exclusive Q&A with the patrons. In addition to this, there's monthly giveaways. We give away, give away gifts to my patron supporters. And it's all like, well, predominantly veteran-owned stuff. I'll go and buy veteran-owned apparel, veteran-owned product services, and I'll give them away to my patron supporters. And I'll also uh, do exclusive invites for events. So you'll get freebie tickets to events. To become a patron of Hey Hour, go to patreon.com forward slash HK podcast. I'm spelling Patreon, P A T R E O N. Patreon.com forward slash HK podcasts. Hit become a patron. And uh, I'll see you on the next Zoom, Q- Zoom QA if you do. Oh, you also get your name in the credits. Thanks for watching. I will catch you next time.